Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You are listening to the Revolution Health Radio Show. I'm your host, Steve Wright, co-author at scdlifestyle.com. Revolution Health Radio is created for you and by you. It's also brought to you by 144.me. 144.me is a 14-day healthy lifestyle reset program. So Chris has put together, based on just working with um, hundreds of people and interacting with thousands of people on his blog, he's really realized that, um, much like I have, that it's just really hard to implement things that we talk about when it comes to healthy habits. So sleep, diet, exercise, and stress are all major components that we talk about at the show all the time. But to do them all at one time is pretty much guaranteed in, in the research literature. Unless you have someone holding your hand, you're going to fail. And so 144.me does that in 14 days where step by step, day by day, Chris actually walks you through how do you do all of these healthy habits at the same time so that you can do 14 days of really resetting, getting, getting back to zero, and uh, hopefully starting your new year off right or starting um, whatever month it is off right. So if you haven't checked it out yet, go over to 144.me and do that now. So as always, with me is integrative medical practitioner, healthy skeptic, and New York Times bestselling author, Chris Kresser. Chris, how are you doing today? Good, Steve. How are you? I'm pretty pumped, man. All right. Cool. It's, it's, yeah. good. it's a good day. Good day. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful day here as well. Um, we had a good question. It's one we get a lot, and I think a lot of people are going to be interested in, and one that there are quite a few myths and um, maybe misconceptions about. So, yeah. Before we get into that, though, Chris, uh, we can't go too many episodes without finding out what you're eating before yeah, this episode starts. Right. So, not much to report today. Coffee and cream. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we record the episodes a few weeks before they're published, so this is actually uh, right before Christmas. Lots going on. I'm getting on a plane um, soon to go visit family, so a lot happening, and it's perfect, perfect opportunity to do some intermittent fasting. So that's what I did today. Awesome. Yes, and that's why my background is slightly different than the white walls. I'm at my parents house here in Michigan so nice you don't have the the, the the impressive foam cave that I have and that you normally have huh no no the audio quality is not going to be quite as well but the uh, yeah, we background is a little bit better scen better scenery exactly all right cool so let's uh give this question from Nada a listen hi Chris um I had a question for you about yeast overgrowth I've been on the GAPS diet for about six months now. Um, I've gotten better, but still, still having some symptoms. So I went to a holistic practitioner, and she did the metametrics test, the triad test, and it showed, it confirmed I had a yeast overgrowth. But she wants me to start adding potatoes and things like that back into my diet but I'm really scared to because I know that disaccharides are hard, hard to digest so I wanted to know what your recommendations are about yeast overgrowth treating candida and and sealing the gut barrier because there's so many different um you know different diets online I'm so confused I I really don't know what to do. So looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. All right. So, I mean, if, again, this is something that just that so many people are interested in. If you do some searching for candida or yeast overgrowth on the internet, you're bound to just get <laughs> bludgeoned with uh, a, a crazy level of information. And a lot of it's pretty kooky and quacky and uh, unreliable. No. And, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm I'm glad to have a chance to address this. I mean, we've talked about it here and there in the past, but it's good to just do a really focused uh, episode on it. So before you dive in, Chris, I just want to let everybody listening know that if you'd like to have your question answered, um, go to chriscresser.com forward slash podcast question and hijack go there. The show. Yeah, hijack the show, dude. You know, if you want to talk to us? You got to go there. All right. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. It's, it's, it's so great, as Steve said, to be able to make this show super relevant to you and your needs and what you want to hear about, and that's really how it works. So um, definitely head over there and, and record a question. 
we want to hear your voice. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to break this down into a few different categories. The first is uh, not uh, necessary based on what Nada said uh, in, in her case, um, or I'm assuming it's a her. Uh, sorry if it's a he. But but I want to point this out because it is something that often gets overlooked, and I and I and it's important for you know general population that's thinking about this, and that is the question: Is it really yeast overgrowth? So one of my pet peeves is when I hear people say, "Oh, I've you know I've I've got yeast overgrowth, or I've got candida, or I'm on a candida diet," and I ask them, "Well, how, how do you know that you have candida?" And they say, "Well, because my tongue is white, and I." I spit into a glass of water and the saliva, you know, you know, they, they, all, all of these sort of tests that, or, or um, even just symptoms that are not reliable as a means of diagnosing yeast overgrowth. Um, and, and it's, you know, there's always an assumption made that it's candida, which may be, um, it could be any number of other uh, fungal species. It's really important to test. You know, we, I've I've always said on this show that we're a big believer in the in the in the saying "test, don't guess," um, because part of one of the tenets of functional medicine is that you have to address the underlying cause of a problem in order to get the the best result long term. Um, and you can't address the underlying cause if you don't know what it is, and if you just assume that it's yeast overgrowth based on some symptoms that's not really uh, adequate in terms of making a diagnosis because the you know, symptoms of fungal overgrowth are extremely nonspecific. What that means is they're things that could be caused by any number of other conditions that aren't yeast overgrowth. Um, you know, fatigue, digestive discomfort, uh, muscle aches, brain fog, uh, you know, low libido, hormone imbalance, skin rashes, these are all symptoms that could be attributed to candida or, or fungal overgrowth, but they could also be caused by a parasite or SIBO or general dysbiosis or uh, something in, entirely different like uh, chronic infection such as Lyme disease or co-infection or a biotoxin-related illness like a, like a a mold problem, you know, exposure to a water damaged building, or uh, even potentially an autoimmune condition or a thyroid condition. So, um, and those are not all mutually exclusive. You can have fungal overgrowth and those conditions, and they often do go together. But um, the point is, you need to find out what you're dealing with because the treatments will differ. I treat fungal overgrowth slightly differently than I treat SIBO, for example, or general dysbiosis or a parasite. And certainly I would approach autoimmune disease differently than I would approach fungal overgrowth. So um, there are pretty good tests for uh, fungal overgrowth at this point. The, the best ones are, are stool tests through Genova, you know, formerly Metametrics or Doctors Data. Um, they can detect uh, fu fungal overgrowth in the stool. Uh, you can get a urine organic acids test, which from... Um, Great Plains Laboratories is, is is a good one, and then the Genova Organics profile is also a good one, um, and they will detect organic acids, which which are byproducts of fungal metabolism in the urine. And if they're elevated, it's a sign that there there may be a fungal overgrowth. Uh, you can also test antibodies to Candida in the blood. So so there's a range of ways that you can get some objective data on whether you have uh, Candida. In this case, as I mentioned, not a already had the metametrics test. I'm, I'm assuming she means stool, but she could mean the, the organic acids test as well. I'm not sure. Um, and confirm that there was a fungal overgrowth. So, so uh, it seems like she's covered that base. Yeah, I think it's really um, important just to kind of reiterate what you're saying there that a lot of the general symptoms or things that we notice in our lives when we're sick could be attributed to yeast overgrowth, but they could be attributed to lots of other things. And I don't know what your experience has been, but my personal health history, and well as uh, you know, the people that I've worked with and the thousands I've talked to, typically it's not just yeast. Yeah. And so um, this idea of not testing and sort of just uh, or going off just one test and assuming, hey, hey, I found something. That's it. That's that's the one singular root cause. Um, I think it's really important to to make sure people understand that that 
could set you back. That sort of belief could set you back quite a bit and, and have you wasting a lot of time and money. Yeah, great point. And I agree. I would say maybe 15% of the time or 20% max, it's just fungal overgrowth without you know, SIBO or parasites or some other issue and, and 80% or 85% of the time it's, it's something else in addition to fungal overgrowth. So great point, Steve. Um, point, so, so moving on to the second point, which is the, the appropriate diet for treating yeast overgrowth. Um, Nada mentioned she's been on GAPS for six months, and this is certainly a good choice uh, with some caveats for, for yeast overgrowth. Now, if you're not familiar with GAPS, it's based on the specific carbohydrate diet, um, and both of those approaches remove uh, complex carbohydrates, uh, polysaccharides and disaccharides from the diet. So uh, when we talk about carbohydrates, we're talking about different arrangements of glucose molecules and we have uh, monosaccharides which are single sugars like glucose um, which are very rapidly absorbed in the upper part of the small intestine they just um, don't require a lot of absorption because single molecules can pass directly across the lumen of the gut into the bloodstream then you have things like disaccharides which would be lactose um, as an example which have to be split. They're, they're, they're double sugar molecules. They have to be split into single sugar molecules before they can be absorbed. And in people with uh, poor digestion and absorption and, and, and uh, fungal overgrowth and SIBO and these conditions, those disaccharides don't get properly broken down. They linger around in the gut and they can be, become food for pathogenic yeast and bacteria uh, and other critters in the gut that, that we don't necessarily wanna be feeding. And then polysaccharides would be starches or, or any uh, carbohydrates that have longer chains of glucose molecules linked together, and they're even more difficult to break down. So that's the theory with GAPS and specific carbohydrate diet. And so the idea is if you have a fungal overgrowth, you should avoid disaccharides and polysaccharides um, because they're difficult to break down and they may potentially feed these overgrowths or infections. Now, um, I want to point out that it's overgrowth is probably the best term because uh, candida is, is a normal resident of the digestive tract, as are many of the species of bacteria that become overgrown in SIBO. And it's not like you have an infection with a parasite or something that shouldn't be in the gut but is there. What's generally happened in these situations is, is something that is, is normally in the gut has become overgrown and overrepresented in relation to some of the other beneficial species of, of gut bacteria. So the reason I mention that is because it hints at a different approach. You know, the idea is not to just completely wipe out these species because that's not even necessarily desirable. The idea is to get things back into balance. And that's really the focus of any kind of treatment for um, uh, fungal overgrowth. Now, yeah. That, that's such a great point, Chris, that I think has taken a long time to sort of like begin to get out in the world. And so a lot of the articles people are going to be reading when they have these yeast overgrowths are not pointing that out. And I think that that's one of those other fundamental beliefs that if you have the belief that all yeast is bad or, or something like that, then you're probably going to adopt a different treatment strategy that that um, I think you and I have both seen very non-effective. Yeah, well, the, the systemic antifungal drugs are a good example of that. I mean, they can just really wipe out fungal uh, species in the body and, and that can, they can have a, a pretty dramatic effect when, you know, when you move from yeast overgrowth to, um, and you start using those drugs, you can have a big improvement in symptoms, but if you take them for too long, it wipes, you start wiping out the beneficial yeast in the body and beneficial yeast actually protect against bacterial overgrowth. <laughs> So ironically, what happens uh, with uh, long-term use of those systemic antifungals is you can have a higher risk of SIBO, bacterial overgrowth, and dysbiosis that's caused by a lack of beneficial yeast. So, um, you know, we need to get away from this warlike mentality that we have with, I mean, I think this came out of the whole age of antibiotics and, and the discovery that, you know, pathogens cause disease. And that was an important discovery, but it led to this sort of warlike mentality, of, you know, where we're going to use these powerful drugs to absolutely 
obliterate and destroy these you know bacteria and, and other pathogens but of course now we have a much different understanding where we know that these bacteria are we live in symbiosis with them we absolutely depend on them for not only our survival but to uh, several different aspects of health so we've gotten a little bit overzealous in our um, killing mentality and and I think in the next you know even it's already shifting as you said Steve but in the next you know 10 to 20 years there's going to be much more of an appreciation of balance and and regulation of the ecosystem rather than you know uh, the carpet bombing type of approach we've been doing so far so back to the the diet um, the, the trouble with gaps and SCD depending on how they're done is that they can be extremely low carb diets and if if they're extremely low carb uh, you can they can become ketogenic which means you start producing ketones and there, uh, Paul Jaminé was one of the first people to start talking about this uh, a few years ago, but there are several studies that suggest that candida and other yeast can actually thrive on ketones. So this is one of my biggest problems with a, a, a very low uh, carbohydrate gaps, SCD, or even sort of typical candida diet that removes every possible source of glucose or sugar in the diet. That can lead to ketone production, and then there are studies, for example, that show that neutrophils, which are white blood cells, are less able to kill candida when ketones are present. Uh, there are studies of, of um, diabetic patients with ketoacidosis, you know, a lot of ketone production, developing can candida uh, overgrowth. There, there are uh, studies of obese people developing candida infections when they're when when fasting causes ketosis um, there are studies showing that serum drawn from fasting patients is less protective against candida than serum drawn after meals and that antifungal drugs and i would assume uh, botanicals tend to work better in a fed state than a fasted state where ketone production would be occurring so there's there's this whole kind of constellation of evidence that's pointing to the idea that ketone production is not a good idea. So, you know, I guess what I would say is if, if you do do a GAPS, or especially like a GAPS intro or an SCD intro, that that should probably be temporary. And even then you might not want to do it so that it's so low carb. Um, and you can test your urine with keto sticks to see, you know, to, to make sure that you're not in ketosis and you can eat more of the non uh, disaccharide, you know, the, the safe, fruits, for example, that are permitted on the GAPS or the SCD diet. Um, and, and, you know, if you're, con if you're continuing to avoid the, the disaccharides uh, and polysaccharides like the starches and, and the, the, the more complex sugar molecules. Um, I think it's important to sort of point out what I think you're hinting at, which is that uh, these diets, um, GAPS and SCD, which, you know, I'm a big fan of and, and have done a lot of work around, are not the solution. Yeah. Like it's another form of sort of starving, destroying. Um, and so a lot of people, including myself, have gotten a lot of benefit from being on a diet like this. But the idea that any one of these diets is going to starve or kill a yeast infection or a SIBO infection is, is in my opinion, thoroughly false now. You're, and you're so step, you're a step ahead of me. That's, that's, that's point number three that we're about to make. So. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, we're on the same page. I do. Before I go on, I do want to say I, I generally in my practice, I don't start people with gaps or um, SCD for fungal overgrowth or SIBO. We use a low FODMAP diet for those conditions. And I, and I find that that typically works very well. Uh, FODMAPs are uh, it's a slightly different take. It's a similar theory. You know, the idea is FODMAPs are, are fermentable oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharides and polyols. So there are certain types of carbohydrates that are poorly broken down and they become food for the fungal, fungal overgrowth or bacterial overgrowth. Um, however, with a low FODMAP diet, I think it's easier to, there are more carbohydrates that are permitted, including some starches, uh, which, which, you know, might seem contradictory to the GAPS approach. And it is, it's, it's different approach, but I've found that many people can tolerate some starches on the FODMAP diet if they have fungal overgrowth and bacterial overgrowth and, 
they do well and we see success. You know, we, I always, we test people and then we retest people after they're treated and we see the fungal and markers and the bacterial markers changing and going away. If they don't, we might then switch to like a, a GAPS or SCD intro and, uh, um, as long as there's enough carbohydrates so that it's not ketogenic. So um, I think either of those will work. Low FODMAP is a starting place. GAPS or uh, SCD, as long as you're eating enough fruit and, and carbohydrates so that you're not going into ketosis. And again, you can test that with the keto sticks, uh, which are the urine strips. Uh, those are both good choices. So one thing that neither one of us has mentioned, probably because we don't like it, but uh, or don't like to mention it, is the anti-candida diet, which oh, yeah. anybody uh, who's Googling this issue is going to run into a thousand websites yeah. that talk about this. I'm, but, uh, I'm right there with you. I was just about to mention that I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of the anti-candida diet. I, I think it's uh, both unnecessarily restrictive and not restrictive enough. Um, so for in the, in the unnecessarily restrictive category, it removes literally like every source of glucose. I mean, on the extreme versions, you see even carrots and things like that, uh, prohibited because they have too much sugar. Um, however, as I mentioned, if you do that, you're going to probably end up in ketosis, um, which can actually make things worse. And I've just never seen any peer reviewed evidence that suggests that that's necessary. Uh, in terms of the not restrictive enough, many candida diets actually permit grains, um, which is strange when they're trying to get rid of every source of sugar um, and grains are ultimately carbohydrate for the most part. Um, and they're also poorly broken down uh, for many people because they're pretty, they're complex carbohydrates. So, you know, you'll see it, the anti-candida diet permitting um, grains, particularly the, the alternative grains like quinoa and millet and things like that. And I just don't see those things working well for most people who have gut issues. Um, so, so that's something to keep in mind. I don't, I don't think that the quote anti-candida diet is very effective. And, and if it was, you wouldn't see people on it for years and years um, having the experience that they have. So that's something to be avoided. Now, point number three is what you just mentioned um, a little while back, Steve, and, and, and that's this. Diet is not typically enough to treat fungal overgrowth and SIBO, in my opinion. It's, a, it's definitely a big part of the strategy and it's important, but when we have a patient that has fungal overgrowth or SIBO, we absolutely, without exception, will use antimicrobials. And we, you know, we start with uh, botanicals and 90% and of the time that's what we use in some cases where the patient has just recurring recalcitrant infections um, we might start to use some prokinetics like low dose naltrexone and and uh, possibly rifaximin and neomycin if they have a methane overgrowth which are which are medications but uh, almost almost exclusively we're using botanical nutrient-based protocols so some of the ones that we use and that, and that have research behind them and tend to work well would be undecylenic acid, uva ursi, cat's claw, pau de arco, uh, lauric acid, which is monolaurin or lauricidin, uh, high dose biotin actually is antifungal, like uh, five milligrams uh, per day. Uh, Gymnema sylvestre, which is a, uh, a, a, an herb that has been used historically in India um, as a uh, for, for blood sugar issues because it, it reduces sugar cravings uh, and help, helps balance blood sugar it has recently been shown to be very effective in, in terms of inhibiting candida growth. Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a beneficial strain of yeast, has been shown to inhibit the growth of candida and also reduce inflammatory cytokine production that uh, is associated with cells that are infected with candida. Soil-based probiotics um, like prescriptocyst uh, are, are, I think, eff effective in terms of um, outcompeting uh, candida for adhesion sites in the gut. So all of these things, uh, many of which we've talked about before, can be really effective in an, in an overall antifungal strategy, and I think they're very important. Um, and if you've been doing a GAPS approach, for example, for six months and you still have symptoms and you're not doing these other things, then that's absolutely something to look into.
The last point would be uh, remember the kind of two phase approach, which is you know when there's any kind of infection, the first phase is clearing out the infection and the pathogens or the overgrowth if there if it's not an infection but it's an overgrowth. But the second phase is really important as well, and that's restoring and rebuilding. So. Um, the reason you can't necessarily do both at the same time is some of the things that you use to restore and rebuild, like prebiotics, for example, can actually make the overgrowth worse. So uh, resistant starch and non-starch polysaccharides, which are FODMAPs, of course, and also prohibited on the GAPS type of approach, they're really helpful over the long term for restoring and growing beneficial bacteria in the colon and the reason you want to do that is because that's what's going to prevent a recurrence of fungal overgrowth in the future. And what I often see uh, happening is patients will focus too, you know, too much on the killing part and the eradication, and they'll stay on that diet or that approach for a long, you know, kind of perpetually, and they're essentially continuing to starve their good gut bacteria. And it's interesting to see that there have even been studies about this now. I, I, saw, I recently saw a paper that said, <clears throat> essentially was, was saying, hey, the low FODMAP, you know, it was like something that we could have talked about, Steve, in a show. But the, the paper <clears throat> was saying, yeah, the low FODMAP diet is undoubtedly effective for, 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 for IBS, but maybe we don't want to be prescribing this to patients long term because it's really low in microbiota accessible carbohydrates which are the types of carbohydrates that feed the beneficial gut bacteria and now of course we know how important that is over the long term um i thought it was a great paper because the researchers were basically backing up what we've said all you know numerous times on this program which is you have to distinguish between a therapy something that has a therapeutic effect and that you use for a short period of time until you don't need it anymore with something that you might do over the long term. And, you know, to use an analogy, if you need a raft to cross the river, when you get to the other side of the river, you, you just leave the raft behind. You don't carry it on your head. <laughs> um, well, you know, unless you're doing some portage and <laughs> you're expecting another river pretty soon. But, you know, basic idea is you don't you use it when you need it and then you leave it behind. And I, for whatever reason, people have a really hard time grasping that. Um, and, you know, you see that in the low carb world, I think, where, where I think it can be a, a super effective therapy and, and a shorter term approach for a lot of conditions and people, but doesn't necessarily need to be the lifetime approach um, or the fact that it tends to work really well as a therapeutic intervention that doesn't necessarily translate into meaning that uh, you know eating carbohydrates and led to the condition in the first place. So we, we get it all time, tends to get kind of convoluted. And the point here uh, that I really want to stress is that once you once you um, get the candida back in, or, or fungal overgrowth back into balance, that's not the stopping place. The next step from there is to rebuild then your beneficial gut bacteria, which is what will prevent the candida from getting overgrown again. And I can tell you, and I'm sure you've had this experience, Steve, that uh, people who get candida, they don't often just deal with it once. It's, it, it tends to recur and be an issue. And I think one of the reasons for that is that they don't stress the rebuilding part as much as they should. Yeah. Yeah, I would echo that. And so just to kind of recap this, um, I think what we hit on here was, was several sort of top mistakes that you can make if you have a yeast or a candida overgrowth. And so I'm going to recap them and then you correct me if I missed or, or whatnot. Um, so the, the big one that you just mentioned was that you people stay in the killing phase and they forget about the fact that we need to feed the microflora and rebalance it. Um, I'm going to pause while this clock goes crazy. Wow, that's a nice little cl clock alarm clock there, Steve. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> My mom loves Christmas. Is that your music box? Oh, yeah, this is what I jam out to yeah. you know, we, to get ready for the podcast. Oh, sweet. Uh, we, we're seeing a different side of you. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm just going to recap this, and correct me if I'm uh, missing any here, Chris, but... Working backwards, uh, one that you just mentioned was people tend to stay in the killing phase too long and don't think about actually rebalancing the microflora and actually feeding it. 
Um, some people assume that uh, diet is the solution to yeast and fungal overgrowth when many times it's not. There needs to be other interventions. Um, when people do do diets to try to help with yeast overgrowth and candida, they typically will end up on a ketogenic diet, which can actually inhibit sort of the, the um, short-term treatments that will actually get rid of the candida. Um, and then I think another big one that we mentioned was the idea that um, I think you put around 80 to 85 percent of the time, um, it's not just a yeast overgrowth issue that they're, you know, and I think this is one of the reasons why people keep getting yeast overgrowth as well. It's, it's because they don't ever get off the killing protocol and they don't realize that there's 80 percent of the chance or, or more that they have maybe another infection or they have a hormone issue or they have an autoimmune issue that they're yeah. not looking at. Yeah. Great recap, Steve. Perfect. And maybe we'll call this episode Four Biggest Mistakes People Make When Treating Yeast Overgrowth. Awesome. I like it. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening again. Remember to submit your questions uh, so, so uh, your voice can be heard. And thanks, as always, for listening. Yeah, and in between episodes, if you want to get Chris's latest studies or, or the latest uh, recipes he's posting, things like that, make sure you're following him on social media. Um, if you're a Facebook user, go to facebook.com forward slash Chris Cresser LAC. If you're a Twitter user, go to twitter.com forward slash Chris Cresser. And uh, thank you for listening. We'll talk to you on the next show. Thanks, everyone.